Welcome back after uh, the afternoon break. Uh, my name is Ben Clausen. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm one of our research managers at CPRC. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the lands in which I'm joining you from, uh, specifically the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Uh, and uh, today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing this afternoon's keynote speaker, Francisco Banez Carrasco. Uh, Francisco will be speaking with us today on the normal that never was. Um, before I turn things over to Francisco, uh, a few quick reminders. Uh, please ensure you uh, help create a safer environment for everyone involved by abiding by our community guidelines. Uh, you can access counseling support by reaching out through the participant directory. Uh, as well, uh, please keep in mind that this session is being recorded, so you really don't have to do that. Uh, and that is also available in English and French, uh, English to French audio trans, uh, interpretation, pardon, uh, and closed captioning is available on the platform features as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please connect uh, with our chat, chat monitor using the chat box on Zoom. So uh, Francisco Ibanez Carrasco's rags to somewhat riches story uh, started with migrating from Chile, from poverty and military dictatorship to Canada at 22, getting diagnosed with HIV in 1985, becoming an AIDS activist in 1989, and pursuing a thrilling combination of community work and qualitative social behavioral research. Currently, he is an assistant professor at the Dalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, a member of the Canada International HIV and Rehabilitation Research Collaborative, and a fiction and nonfiction author. Uh, his research focuses on physical and cognitive rehabilitation in the context of HIV, queer men's sexual health, e-learning for public health, HIV stigma, and autopathography uh, or patient-oriented medical narratives. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Francisco. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, let me start with this story. And uh, on March 23, 2020, I left my previous job at a hospital research center, crying and thinking of killing myself. I was being constructively dismissed. No HR or lawyer thought I had a strong case. And my Mount Sinai hospital shrink was telling me to go, but to go where when uh, one doesn't have job security. I felt at that point that I compromised my queer and community-based research values, that my militancy for past causes and real community-based research had died with the AIDS movement. I had seen enough pauses risk their health for being in a movement. I was working then in the national research on HIV stigma. I did a lot of integrated knowledge mobilization and a lot of other things as I was allowed to do. However, I had also become complicit in turning a global quantitative tool into a set of clinical validated scales and controlling the participation of the community. I had received humiliation from co-researchers as well as from community members. And yes, I knew the game, I know the game, yet the business of research is like any other neoliberal business and can be cruel when one is vulnerable. So I ordered a cab, uh, that was roughly the day we went into lockdown in Toronto. Not sure how I looked like, I'd been crying, I was, I guess, a distressed 50 something old queer men, I suppose. The driver asked me how things were going and I must have mumbled something. Um, and he said, come and sit in the front seat and I did. And on the way home, he started touching himself and telling me he wanted to be happy. So I gave him a really good blow job in my apartment. It made me think that I was still a naked civil servant, that maybe I wasn't born to lead, but to serve, and being at the service of others in research, which of course can be tantamount to saying that one is 100% a bottom or a sub. So that was my normal then, never too normal, because I've never fitted in the normality of others, and who does, right? 
let's talk about normalities and not about the abnormal or extraordinary. And for the purposes of this speech, I am begging you to bear with me to, when I'm equating normal with culture. Culture, everything that we humans change, what we do in it, what it means to us. Culture that is fluid and layered in time and space. And of course, some cultural currents are like warm molasses, sugary and thick and slow burning. Think about intersectional oppressions and how slowly those tectonic plates are moving. But culture can also move at the speed of light. And I invite you to think about our global embodied medicalization and digitization. So I'm saying that I'm asking you to see with me that uh, normalities are fluid and we all incessantly navigate normalities as good as we can. Our power of disruption of subnormalities, such as disrupting heteronormativity, have been dialed down, while our queer lib jingoism has been amplified and blaring. And I read here on June 2nd, 2020, CNN Business reported about a study from the UCLA School of Law's William Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity, Law and Public Policy, that tells us that same-sex weddings have been a boon for the wedding industry since gay marriage was legalized in 2015. And in the years since, it's boosted state and local economies by $3.8 billion. So I propose to you that we see some of these disruptions as being better, in a better place, more liberated. But maybe, but maybe, we're only being better within the normality of neoliberal spaces and practices. We have, after all, neutralized the barebacker. We've helped gentrify porn and kink. We've turned those who were not paused into drug users thanks to the U equal U chemical recipe. And yes, in terms of research, it's likely that we might have more out and visible queers in academia, albeit circumscribed in the same inequitably, inequitable hierarchical structures, but using a plethora of progressive notions of participation, anti-oppression, and equity, which is our current militant, mostly declarative toolkit. It's really painful to see ourselves trying to operationalize these things in the day-to-day -day, in academia and outside academia. So from my working corner, I see that a great deal of our HIV research is imbued with a benevolent view of the world. Nothing wrong with that. We must do good onto others. We must have more self-testing options, uh, HIV self-testing options in the market, HPV. We must eliminate HIV stigma as if it were a thing that one can identify and measure and destroy. And we must adhere to health promotion equation of U equals U. We must exercise more, age successfully, include us in housing for all kinds of, of queers and policy and practice. And it is possible to get research funding for these things, especially if you're in the business of research and have acquired the privileges of that membership. However, it ain't that easy to get funding for research on good old desire, pleasure, or consensual violences. We must often slip those in stealthily. In addition, in social, behavioral, epidemiological, and clinical research, which are the kinds of research that I'm mostly, most immediate with, uh, we're still stuck on very traditional heteronormative methodologies in producing uh, dark narratives, right? Um, neoliberal narratives and practices demand that we have a victim and a culprit, guilty victims, innocent victims, heroes and victimizers. So we've gained some and we're losing some. 
So I say if feeding the machine of neoliberalism is all we're able to do today, well, we, then we need more hours of instruction. So queer health for all health care givers, we need more health care, uh, sorry, queer health promoters, nurses and doctors and teachers. And we must always continue to claim a righteous space in learning about sexualities in the high schools and universities. Supporting healthcare provider instruction is how we sporadically trouble the normalities of consent and participations in others. It's overall an academic fight and flight response because the implicit question is always a bit nervous is how queer do we want curricula or research to get? Let me for a moment pause on the idea of learning and why it is one of our superpowers that we must not let we must not let dial down, dial down, tone down. In um, 2016, my pal Erica Mayners and I were granted a Chicago Leather Archives and Museum Visiting Scholarship. Erica is a professor of education and women's and gender studies at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago. And one defining moment I want to share with you in which I understood the magnitude of our queer contribution to emancipatory learning, to inter generational learning, our intersectional learning, our digital and embodied learning, was when at the Leather and Archives Museum I had my hands on the public health ordinance that ordered the closure of the mine shaft bathhouse managed valiantly by Wally Wallace. I had the chance to go through his box of documents. This is what the media reported then. Homosexual club padlocked in New York anti-AIDS campaign. That was November the 8th, 1985. After shutting down a homosexual club that advertised sadomasochism, Mayor Edward Koch has warned other establishments that they could also be closed as part of the state campaign against the deadly disease AIDS. The Mineshaft was a members-only BDSM gay leather bar and sex club located at 835 Washington Street in the Meatpacking District of New York. It was an iconic site of desire, lust, pleasure, and what we call now sex pigs, and learning. A place where I discover buried into those documents, there was a sort of workshop every week, I think it was uh, fairly frequently, in which, uh, very similar to the kinds of um, demo workshops we have today that we, the, they don't exist a whole lot, but we still have them, um, in which the guys who were coming to the orgy would sit down and learn about sexuality. Many of them had just migrated to the big city and the place was called, and I love this title, the School of Lower Education. The School of Lower Education. So that's just one, one morsel of the kinds of learning that's always existed in our community and is often, I don't know, out of shame, out of expediency, in order to meet the requirements of heteronormative uh, research, we've uh, kind of glossed over that legacy of the past. And, and my effort, small as it may be, has always been to continue to sexualize our research and learning. And you will say that not everyone is sexual in the same way, which is true. And you will say some some persons, including some gays and queers, are not are asexual, which is true. And you might say that sex, uh, sexuality, desires, and pleasures are not the only glue that binds queers, especially gay men. And that might be true. However, disrupting matters. Disrupt disrupting is nostalgic. It remembers 
the past to apply to the present and face the future. In our zeal to package our own queer sensibilities and cultures and sell it wholesale, right? Think RuPaul, think, you know, that we, we, are, we are apparently all out there. There are important portions of our queer memory that are still being glossed over, sometimes silenced, and sometimes erased. I think of my students uh, because many of them, when uh, we get together for the first time, they've heard of the tragedy of AIDS. However, very, very rarely they've heard of the contributions of posies, barebackers, fisters, and camp sex practitioners. They might never ever hear about those. So the Leather Archives and Museum little vignette that I presented to you, um, although it's a very white establishment, it does not mean that we should forget it, we should disprove it, disapprove of it, sorry, or render it useless. We must be critical but not cancel it. Our research must include a historical sexualized understanding of heteronormative colonization of our gay bodies and sensibilities, our practices, and the law. It must include understanding of the bio, the bio power that has been uh, you know, exerted upon us each time, no matter how straight and uh, objective each investigation is. One thought that came to me when I was writing these remarks is that currently CHR requires a community-based research statement and a gender analysis statement of those uh, who say they are working for and with us in our communities. And it seems to me that it's time to have a requirement, yes, yet another requirement, that um, we should have a queer anti-oppression statement. And I'm sure my BIPOC brothers and sisters are also wanting uh, more in terms of the commitment and accountability from researchers. So what to do now? I invite you to continue to ask yourself and ask others, how will you and your team acknowledge, understand, and operationalize the specificity of men who take it up the ass, who fist and wand each other, men who love to lick boots, and understanding this, this constant, fascinating uh, tension between humiliation and self-confidence and liberation. Right, um, we need to continue to talk about fluids and orifices, about men who stretch their bodies in lust and chemistry. So don't just give them another cheesy psychological and neurocognitive validated scale to tick off that reduces us to some results which are usually bad news, right? I mean, we're depressed, we are, we're above risk, uh, normal, normal risk for, you know, doing a lot of bad things. We very rarely talk about the contribution that queers do to the overall culture. And we open the culture and now now that we have been integrated like the Borg, we seem to have lost a little bit of our power. So let the category of queer sexualities continue to penetrate each research question, each learning module, every program of studies related to health policy and practice. Let them not become epidemiological calculations and one, sits, one size fits all health promotion guidelines. A kind of off the left field example is I, I work a lot on rehabilitation, a physical rehabilitation for uh, aging persons living with HIV, including, of course, a large number of men. We're conducting some work on telecoaching and um, 
that uh, really will help people with their loneliness, but also with the stigma that they experience when they go to uh, gyms and other places. Now, the interesting thing is we were very thorough about all the possible reasons that people would like to work out. And, and here I'm referring specifically to gay men. Now, one of the things that never came up, and that was very surprising to me, and maybe that's just because I'm in... Uh, an old horny daddy pig, right? Is that it was never discussed and very politely that we work out with others who look good uh, because we like to see them. It's the eye candy. So it's a very pedestrian thing to notice, right? But at the same time, it's immensely interesting to me how it get, gets glossed over, like, um, I don't know, again, whether it's shame, uh, shame sorry, whether uh, it's inappropriate. I always feel all kinds of weird um, feelings when I bring it up. And uh, when I brought it up in this particular team, the responses were tremendously polite, but it's like, why don't we don't know what to do with that shit, right? Like, well, yeah, people like to see other bodies, but, you know, for me, it seems central to... Uh, inspiring uh, men who are in their 50s and 60s and uh, want to still have a uh, sexual life. They want to look good with whatever they, they have. Um, anyway, so that's one little side example. Um, I think that some of the current interventions on sexualized drug use should be funded and promoted with great pride. And I'm thinking of Jordan Bond Gore from the GMSH, uh, who's preparing an intervention with sexualized substance users. I've seen this kind of efforts, but few and far between over the years. I'm thinking of uh, the late Arne Schilder, uh, the BC Center for uh, Excellence in HIV, and Duncan McLachlan, who does not live in Canada anymore, and, and others. I'm also thinking, when I say these things about the 70 co-learners in the last 10 years in which I managed and programmed the universities without walls, such as Kiefer Card and Nate Lachowski and Mark Gaspar, Daniel Grace and Gerardo Betancourt, to name a few. And they continue to push the envelope in this regard. And in, it is probably not easy to have to navigate this intensely Anglo-normative at times and surely heteronormative meetings in which the, the very discourse is uh, oppressing our sexualities and, and uh, the kinds of things that are considered inconvenient, I imagine. And of course, I'm thinking about the great and fearless pioneers of queer health in Canada, whom I count as my friends, Terry Trussell and Rick Marchand, with whom I would have never been here today, or I think was 15 years ago, uh, or a number of times that I've, I've been invited here. I'm also thinking about four years of investigators, yet another idea that came up from the West Coast uh, with David Brennan and Abby Koch and Lance McCready and Barry Adam, the great Barry Adam, which attends critically and joyfully to these kinds of questions and has been evaluated as having an impact not only in learning about queer subject matters uh, related to health, but also on critical reading of research on, by, and with queers. So to leave you, this is my, this is my thinking. Maybe this dial down of queer research and learning and academia and other fields is the effect of liberation that we do not have to risk much to be okay today, and maybe this is a good thing. And maybe this is what's going on in our polite research and learning. Maybe this is enough for us. On my side, aside from thanking you again for your time, is to say that my professional triumph is not to do these disruptions well. I don't have tenure, 
and my work and research has always been collaborative, serving others, sometimes naked. But my professional triumph is to have been in the way of those who have acquired power to disrupt the normal that never was in research and in learning. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco, uh, for uh, the wonderful presentation. Um, as somebody who has, uh, you know, a background in queer history, I really appreciate um, this attentiveness to turning to the queer past in order to, you know, reimagine what the possibilities are uh, in the present and and uh, in the future around HIV uh, and queer health research. Um, so, folks, uh, we've got some time with Francisco now, uh, and so I invite you all to. Uh, write in some questions for Francisco to answer in the question and answer period. Um, I mean, maybe just to get us started while we wait for some folks to write some stuff in. Um, I mean, Francisco, one of the things that really stands out to me uh, in, in what you presented is, um, you know, these entangle entanglements with queer respectability politics, uh, with like the com commodification of, of queer people and queer culture, uh, and how this is all kind of uh, wrapped up in mainstream HIV research um, and, and very much like, you know, limits the type of work that we're able to do within mainstream HIV research. Um, so uh, I know you've kind of already spoken to this a little bit in the latter portion of the presentation, um, but are there any other ways uh, you want to, you know, point towards um, in terms of how we can push back against that kind of external context? In short, like, is there like, are there other ways forward and what do, what do those ways kind of look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's um, in some of some of my remarks have been very lofty and, and broad and but that was the intention. I thought I wanted to present that instead of like one specific case that may or not represent what I'm trying to say. I think there are different tools across generations. I think young generations like yourself have different kinds of tools. I came by virtue of my intersectionality uh, to research in a way um, with few tools and one of them, and here I'm going to be crass in case, you know, we, we give warnings about everything these days. I had to bend over and I bend over and taken it a lot. Some of it is great fun. Some of, it, some of it has been very eroding of who I am. Those acts of now we call micro and macro uh, insults and invalidations and disavowals have been plentiful. I think um, we now have some pieces that are more policy oriented, they're more concrete that young researchers need to attach to and need to fight for, right? In order to, uh, really to reduce the power of heteronormative um, heteronormative research. Now, one of the big problems, one of the big bastions, um, if that's a word in English, of heteronormative research is the funding agencies, right? I mean, still today, and this is not to demonize my, my white uh, sisters and brothers, because I, my skin is white as well, is um, that we still have a lot of straight white men deciding things. I mean, just look at Chirac, uh, the, the, the committee at CIHR, just look at other bodies, right? It's like we have to constantly insert the queer, right? It's not that there is a place there. Just as we're, we're having to insert almost, you know, like, much to the chagrin of many, Black Lives Matter and Indigenous. I mean, it's a constant, it's been for me with, with uh, brothers and sisters from Indigenous world, from, from BIPOC, uh, 30 years of that. How do we change this policy so it really gives the room and the power to someone who's not the white male researcher with a lot of power? They're white female researchers as well, so let's demonize all of them. I hope that answered a little bit of that. I I have I have a, um, I have a hope in policy. So that's very weird to say, but if we change the law so we are able to marry, why 
wouldn't be able to change the way we require researchers to be accountable for their research. And you kind of pointed towards one of those funding mechanisms uh, in terms of like articulating queer anti-oppressive practice within like a CIH or, you know, funding structure, for example. Clearly, I'm thinking of Michelle, I think it's Michelle Fine's old, old, uh, many have read it, uh, reading called Why Doesn't This Feel Empowering, right? And I've been in many meetings in which I, I'm empowered to go and speak and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not going to lose my job over this, right? I'm not saying a peep here. So, uh, Again, I'll invite folks to lots of comments, uh, great, great feedback on the presentation, but if folks have any specific questions, uh, please feel free to type them in. Um, but another thing that really stood out to me is, uh, you know, the lack of emphasis on pleasure within mainstream HIV and queer health research. Um, so how do we insert pleasure back into the equation in the work that we're doing? Well, you're talking to the wrong person because I've been I've been unable to do that. I mean, I gave that little example about research that I'm in which I'm nominated. I'm, I'm a principal, co-principal investigator. Sorry. And it's always like, oh, floating in the air. Right. Like, oh, but I know it's a very simplistic thing, but I was so amazed that in our amazing research was well funded and all would never ask like, hey, maybe maybe gay men in whatever age or shape they are, they want to work with a coach, not only because they're lonely, poor people are going to die of AIDS, but they're also, uh, they want to see something good looking. It's a very simple, if I hope not simplistic idea of desire. I mean, um, the, if you look at the desire on what edging, what fisting, what uh, winding means for gay men and for their sexual health, Few and far between, right, is research on douching. I mean, when was the last time you, you read a good piece, a good rigorous scientific piece on douching and what's the point of it and why we do it? So I'm gonna to turn to a question here from Len, um, who's wondering if you have any thoughts about public health's uh, seeming focus or obsession with preventing or ending HIV and STIs. Uh, do you think this narrative that public health's ultimate goal always seems to be preventing infections plays into the erasure of queer sexualities and some of the power dynamics you've talked about? Thank you, Len. It's good to, it's good to have you here in the ethernet. Um, much appreciated. Well, I think public health is not in the business of preventing anything. They're in the business of surveillance, right? And finding very polite, nice ways of, of keeping us all kind of, I, you know, I know it sounds like, um, how you call that, uh, uh, that kind of theory when people think, oh my God, the, 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 the governments are here to chip me when they give me a vaccination. Um, it sounds like that, but it really, it, in the end, it is, it is a form of surveillance uh, that we complicitly and joyfully, <laughs> you know, take part into. And U equals U is a great idea, it's a great social marketing tool, but it has a little sinister side to it, right? One of them, for example, is that erases, erasure is a good word, erases the, the all the, the lives and the sexual lives and sexualities and desires of gay men up to the point in which we became undetectable. It turns out that you, all of us, talked about ourselves as agents of infection for 30 years. And all of a sudden, big people signed off that we're not. And fine, beautiful. Thank you. And I hope they apply this to the law. I mean, I, I forgot to mention Alex McClendon, for whom I have tremendous respect and admiration uh, doing work in, in, in terms of criminalization. But then the past, that those 30 years of having been in the HIV apartheid, put them up your ass because nobody remembers them now. We're safe. It's you equals you. And I know I'm being sarcastic, but I don't know other way to react to it. 
I mean, it certainly erases this, you know, 30, 40 year trajectory of community grassroots activism in response to HIV and AIDS when we just focus on these biomedical interventions as the, as the solution. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So thank you for that, Francisco. Uh, another question here. Um, a lot of us know that many health units, even in community settings, are rife with heteronormative practices and mandates. So how can I, a future queer social worker, hold my anti-oppressive queer values when working in the field? Well, I don't know, but those are the places where you really, uh, you really run risks, right? Because uh, the idea of risk and gay men is always because, you know, you get too much calm or you, you know, inhale too much meth and then, and then you bleed and that's you get infection. That's the idea that risk, right? I think the real risks the real risk for queers in the workplace and learning institutes is precisely that, that we're still playing very politely by other rules. And it's only people like you, my friend who asked the question, sticking your, I'm not saying you're gonna be safe by the way, right? You might be safer if you get a lot of loads in a bathhouse than if you stick your neck out in a meeting and tell your human resources person that they need to be looking for certain things and certain accommodations or certain understandings. But those are the only ways, right? It, I really believe that it, it's amazing how culture at some levels moves so slowly. It's like prodding an elephant to move one step forward and sometimes moves a step behind. Um, so again, just invite folks to add any other questions that have come up for you uh, in this discussion. Um, another question here, uh, is there a magic gray zone between chemsex, harm reduction, and rehab centers uh, or counseling when it comes to creating and sustaining queer-made solutions? Mm. Well, I will not talk about that, but, but. <laughs> I will throw other people under the bus because they're wonderful people. And I mentioned Jordan because the work that he's doing um, will uh, empower people who are chem users, right? Oh, horrible people. I mean, oh, chem users, terrible people. And I think one of the th terrible things about them is we envy them because they have a lot of fun, right? But nobody bothers to do a lot of research about uh, meth and microdosing and things like that. But I think that's, that's uh, the help, right? That will help us understand the limits of harm reduction. Uh, they're going to do a particular, uh, um, anyway, I don't want to disclose uh, Jordan is uh, best suited to talk about their intentions. We're here to help with the technical piece. Um, in some lived experience, I had the chance to double in meth in, uh, before I moved to Toronto. I, frankly, I tell you, if I could, I would. I'm just too old for it. Um, but that's again, right? We're, we're always like, oh, meth and and bad people and they get overdosed and stuff. All those things happen, but we never really examine how much fun these people have. And by contrast, how terrible it is to have thousands of people die alone of fentanyl overdose in Canada. That's not fun. So why not recover? Not why not why not retrieve the amazing learnings that we have from our own communities? Uh, I guess one other question that came up for me was just around how uh, folks living with HIV have um, kind of been marginalized within a lot of this work, this more recent HIV uh, and queer health research uh, kind of oriented work. Um, so I guess I just wonder a little bit about how how can we how can we ensure that folks living with HIV are really lead, leading this work? Um, I mean, it doesn't seem like a very challenging thing, but it's not happening uh, in the ways that it should be. No, it's not happening. Uh, about two hours ago or three hours ago, I hosted a national uh, Latinx um, panel with uh, a number of people who work in HIV and um, men, gay men living with HIV. And one of them was under 25 years old. And I was amazed by the response of everything's okay. I'm okay, I'm so lucky, I got the drugs right away, which of course, and I remember Terry and uh, Trussell and Rick Marchand doing research on this long time ago about like our 
uh, we historically have disconnected from mace organizations, we don't need them. I think we've sold an incredible dream to young people who might or not live with HIV or other conditions that they're normal, that they're okay, that it's all fine. So there's less affinity, it seems to me, um, less affinity and, 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 and they feel that, well, everything seems to be done already. I mean, that's you equals you. Why, why would we need to participate? And that's a beautiful thing about uh, David Brennan's and my colleagues, uh, colleagues um, uh, investigators, right? And I know investigators are across the country and bless them, I just love them. It's because uh, we managed to attract youth who have not wholesale bought into the dream that everything's okay. You know, they tell us that they had not really been in contact with others. They had not thought about these things uh, with others. And I'm surprised because on television, it seems that we're all okay, right? I mean, we have the biggest, uh, uh, you know, uh, gay parades and all of that. I, I, I'm just amazed by the contradiction. Now, on the other hand, the old, you know, pigs like myself feel that uh, we, we were raised codependently. I have no inkling of living my life and my personal and professional life without the help of others. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the things that keeps me in contact and, and doing some work. I think we have time for one final question here. So um, have you seen policy tools within the research or academic setting that are successful in creating the kind of ethical or pleasure-based practice that you're talking about? Uh, for example, community partners writing letters doesn't seem to be doing it. I agree with the latter for sure. No, I uh, very rarely, I mean, I, I'm always surprised of how inconvenient I mean, I, I, I was born in the 60s, right? So uh, for me, the, there's, I, I have an innate necessity to say cock and to say fuck and to say the fist, right? Um, and I'm amazed at the very discourse that gets circulated that is very like, nobody says to me, well, I've heard it a lot, including my bosses for a long time, like, you're too much, you need to tone it down. I mean, the number of times that I've been, I've been told that, including when I published my memoirs, that were censored, any advanced, advanced pieces were censored in Canada, thanks to uh, the ACE Bureau. Yeah, there you, there you go, there's a name. Um, so I'm amazed at how potent the discourse still is. It reminds me when I was growing up in Chile and people would whisper if somebody had cancer, she has cancer. For me, it's like, hey, really? Anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it brings, it triggers a lot of memories. Um, well, we have reached the end of our time together, folks. So thank you so much, Francisco, for thank taking you. the time and sharing your knowledge with us uh, and for answering all these excellent questions that have come in from folks who are attending. Um, and uh, just a reminder to please uh, share your feedback on the session by completing the evaluation form. Uh, thanks, everyone.